In 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled separate but equal, unconstitutional, and ordered the southern states to integrate their schools. Like much of the South, Virginia's leaders were determined to resist the ruling, and some even threatened to close public schools. You know, we were kind of all in denial. Oh, no, they'll never shut the schools down. They can't do that. You know, people have to go to school. And seeing them locked down with chains, I mean, you don't have a question about it, then you know that our schools are closed. Before 1954's court ruling, African Americans were excluded from white society. Segregation was the way of the South. We could not attend the same schools. We could not eat at the same restaurants or drink at the same water fountains or be involved in the same associations. Blacks were not allowed inside the store to look at the racks and pick the clothes off of the rack. The bus terminal you know, had one side for white and the other side colored only, where you would be around on the other side, and it was filthy, and there was no bathroom for you. We couldn't go to theaters. We couldn't ride on the front of the bus. <laughs> all of that, I experienced all of that, you know. And this was the South, and segregation was the rule of the day. I had to walk through a white neighborhood to get through my, to my school. We knew each other, but we didn't play together, and, we didn't grow up together. Separation was real. Growing up in Arlington was almost like a schizophrenic situation where when you went across the bridge into Washington, D.C., so many things were integrated. You come back across the bridge to come home and everything was segregated. We had a ritual sometimes when my mother would take me maybe downtown to D.C. and we would go shopping. If I had done everything and been good, we would stop and get maybe a hamburger and a chocolate shake. This one particular Saturday, we happened to go to a local department store here in Arlington. And I had been good that day. And I said, Mom, I want my hamburger and my chocolate shake. And she said, oh, today we're not going to do that. We got some other place else to go. I was about five years old. I mean, I said, wait a minute. I've done everything I was supposed to. Why can't I have it? What did I do wrong? I decided as we walked by to walk away from her and walk on in and sit up on the lunch counter. And my mother was devastated and she says, no, 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 you can't do this. And I started crying and making a scene. She ended up picking me up and carrying me out. I remember her getting so upset, almost crying herself about this, especially as she tried to talk to me and explain to me why this particular day we couldn't do this. She told me that unfortunately, certain people in the world did not view everybody else as equal. And there are places where you can do certain things and some places where you can't. That was the first time that I really became conscious of that there was a separate situation in our country. The doctrine of separate but equal fueled the South's Jim Crow laws. Even public schools were segregated. White schools fared much better than underfunded black schools. This is a high school drama class taught by Miss Brickus at Booker T. Washington High School. We start our drama course with the fundamentals of dramatics. And through plays in the auditorium, through classroom activities, and through presentation to the public, the student finds that he's not often a lost cause, but has a great latent ability that would not have been brought forth otherwise. The only thing we had in the black schools were excellent teachers, excellent teachers. They taught us a lot, they demanded a lot, and I learned a lot from my teachers. That, that was actually the basis of you know, my education. They just cared about how we did and uh, how we were as students and, and our people. 
And in our classroom, we had to do our schoolwork because if we didn't, she had a pedal about this thick. You hold your hand out, if you didn't get ten, your hand would be red because uh, if you don't do your schoolwork, you know, you, she would let us know. So we knew to do our schoolwork. We didn't fool around. And on our globe, the prime meridian divides the globe into east and west. Each meridian is 15 degrees apart, and there are 180 meridians east and 180 meridians west. All the meridians we knew that the teachers were interested in us learning. The teachers were family-like to all of us because they knew our parents and the parents knew them. The teachers didn't have very few things to work with because the books and the equipment that they received was sent from the white schools to the black schools and they were already five years old when they got them. Quite often there would be all kinds of, of uh, racist statements scribbled in the books and you know the head ends and so forth and uh, very derogatory things. When you think of a high school you think of generally all the classrooms well equipped you've got uh, gymnasium well equipped you've got cafeteria and kitchens well equipped <laughs> athletic fields with lights and all of those kinds of things None of those things were in this building. None of them. Horrible. Horrible. This school, as far as the heating, when it came to wintertime, we would have to come with our overcoats and, and some uh, cotton gloves and, and sit in here because they didn't have enough money to keep the heat up to a certain level. When they got their new fleet of buses, then the old fleet was passed to us. And my uncle Adrian was driving one of those buses. Then we drove all the way back and got to the front yard of our home. And the steering rod just fell down on the ground as he was trying to park it. My grandmother and everybody, they just hooted and hollered, just, you know, thinking of how many kids could have been killed. When Barbara Johns was a student here and she was on the debate team and she would go out to other schools and she could see that facilities in those other schools were much better. She knew that black parents had been fighting with the all-white school board to try and make the conditions better. The building was built to house 180 students in 1939. Student population was nearly 490, so the walls were pulsating. Moton High School junior Barbara Johns led a student walkout in 1951 protesting the unequal facilities in the black schools. Separate but equal was the Plessy versus Ferguson decision of the Supreme Court in 1896. And it established uh, essentially the precedent for Jim Crow laws, which said that you can treat black and white separately as long as you treat them equally. And there was a wink and a nod because everyone knew even then it would never be equal. Separate but equal was always a fallacy and an outrage. There was nothing equal about the separate schools. Everybody knew that. It was not until the mid-30s that the NAACP began what I call a seminar uh, with the Supreme Court, saying roughly, you guys know what separate is. Do you know what equal is? A court case arose from the Moton School walkout. Davis v. Prince Edward County, which was grouped together with four other cases argued by the lawyers for the NAACP. The U.S. Supreme Court declared separate but equal unconstitutional in its ruling on Brown v. Board of Education. This 1954 decision set off a wave of emotions in the South. I guess in 1954, I was a sophomore going to junior in high school when the 54 decision came down. And all my neighbor friends thought I'd be going to Douglas Freeman, which was about 10 minutes away. You know, everybody thought overnight things were going to change. And, you know, nothing really changed after it came down. It took quite a while before anything happened. 
America created this ideal society that depended on white privilege as a way of controlling the masses who were poorer. They used that to enhance sort of this idealism that the rightful heirs of Virginia were the white males. And when that privilege was threatened in the first really serious way, with the decision of Brown versus Board of Education calling not just for the end of school segregation, that was what it technically called for, but it implied the end of a white supremacy culture. The Brown v. Board decision created a new day potentially of equal opportunity. The only problem was the senior elected leadership in Virginia from the senators to the governor to the General Assembly were determined that separate but equal would prevail. It was Virginia and her leaders that organized the Southern Manifesto signed by 101 Southern congressmen. The editor of the Richmond News Leader in the summer and fall of 1955 had been running a series of editorials advocating the use of interposition, the old doctrine from pre-Civil War era that a state could interpose its sovereignty to stop federal court actions. James J. Kilpatrick is a very persuasive writer, he's a very skillful polemicist, uh, so he really created a feeling among the segregationists in Virginia that if we push back hard enough, we might be able to turn this thing around. In 1956, the southern states were scrambling to find a way to stop school desegregation. Led by U.S. Senator Harry Byrd, Virginia passed a series of bills known as Massive Resistance Laws, which included the mandate to refuse funding for any public school that was about to integrate. That no public, elementary, or secondary schools in which white and colored children are mixed and taught shall be entitled to or receive any funds from the state treasurer for their operation. School desegregation was beginning in a number of southern states. In Arkansas in the fall of 1957, when whites resisted federal court orders to integrate, President Eisenhower dispatched military troops to escort nine African-American students into a formerly all-white school. Little Rock sent a signal to Virginia that it was under siege, that the federal government at some point would attempt to impose its will and force desegregation. But it also meant that in the South, the federal government became just as it had been during the Civil War and afterwards, uh, the oppressor. I knew we were going to that Berryville High School, Johnson Williams, and some of the students went to Manassas, but they stayed during the week and came home on weekends. But we came home every night, you know. My mother had to get us up at 4.30. We probably left at 5 to catch that bus at 6 to get to school by 8. 50 miles one way, 50, because they had to pick up kids in the, uh, the backwoods. That was a long ride. It was a long day. Especially commuting that far in the winter time. It seemed like the winter time is the most dangerous time when the roads ice up. We were coming home from school and it was snowing from Berryville, Virginia. And we were in those backwoods or back roads and the bus slid off and went down this hill. We just had to stay there and wait until uh, another driver come by and stop and ask what can he do to help. We couldn't get out, you know. So we just leaned to the side. Remember, there was no cell phones back then. And it was very cold, very cold. And we didn't get home till about 8 o'clock that night. My brother and I, I guess my father was worried, mother was worried to death. And parents were really upset, you know. And I can just imagine that he was sick and tired of sending his children out of the county to go to a high school. And this is what I guess caused the parents to really rally for us to go to Warren County High. In 1958, after several court victories for the NAACP, African American students registered to enter several white schools in Virginia. Many of the localities introduced a testing process to prevent school desegregation. We had to be tested 
not only for the grade you were going into, but two above it. We had to be interviewed, and I can still remember the interview. Big white men. To me, they were huge, and they were behind these desks that remind you of a judge's desk in court. And there was nine of them. My parents were with me, so I was okay. I answered the questions. Then they asked my parents to leave the room. And I admit, I can still feel the fear in my heart. But they refused me for two reasons. One, because I was nervous, and they said that I would show nervousness in their school. The second reason was I was doing math on a 10th, 11th grade level, but I was only reading on a 9th grade level. So they said I couldn't read but I hadn't been in the eighth grade yet. On our first report to the court, we denied admission to all 151 for various reasons. The court returned our report and asked that it be reconsidered. The mayor of Norfolk at uh, 50 years ago was a fellow named Duckworth, very tough guy. The city council here together with the school board actively engaged in trying to deny the full implementation of Brown. There was drama going on in the courthouse where you had a very tough federal judge, Walter Hoffman, who was doing everything he could to enforce Brown versus Board on the local city. After the Brown decision, you had individual court decisions ordering limited integration in various localities. And those localities would delay and drag their feet and appeal uh, to the higher levels of the courts. And finally, we got down to the fact that there were no further appeals and certain school systems either had to desegregate or they had to close. In the fall of 1958, the courts ruled to allow the selected African-American students into the white public schools. The massive resistance laws were enforced. Several schools in Virginia were closed. Governor Almond, uh, with a letter to uh, the city, uh, seized the six schools where these 17 children were going to go and uh, demanded that they be closed. And when that happened, all of the white students who were there as well, there were nearly 10,000 of them, were also locked out. Edward R. Murrow, who actually gave the class that name, the Lost Class of 59, CBS came down and did a documentary here in Norfolk that uh, fall when the schools were closed. We shall begin by showing you 17 of the 10,000 who can't go to public schools in Norfolk. Had they not applied for admittance to six Norfolk schools, neither the Supreme Court's decision nor the district ruling that implemented the integration decision of 1954, nor the Virginia state government's vow to resist massively would have been tested here. Though the governor closed schools in three different localities, Norfolk was the largest where over 10,000 students were kept out of six schools. Edward R. Morrow's groundbreaking documentary exposed the division between whites on the school closings. Most whites were in favor of segregated education, but they were forced to decide between segregation or public schools for their children. Without the public schools, the businesses cannot stay in Norfolk, and no business will come to Norfolk. As it is, the only leaders we're hearing are the leaders of massive resistance. They're trying to tell us somehow that massive resistance is fair and just and right, and we are somehow traitors to the things we believe in. We're not going along with massive resistance. It is true that several schools, as you well know, have been closed under operation of state law. But those children, most of them, are being accommodated uh, on a private instruction basis. Throughout Virginia, students were looking for any means of education. Many white students attended private segregated schools within their own county, while many African Americans had to move away to continue their education. The NAACP from For All and another interested group from Washington, D.C., who had joined forces to work with us, they were going to find places so that we wouldn't be out of school too long. And, you know, I often wondered, why did we go to Washington, D.C.? Why so far? Because they were integrated, and they, I think they wanted us to get a feel of what it was like to be in an integrated school. 
white kids were going to classes in basements and churches and people's homes and the teachers were paid still so that was their emergency response to the closing of the schools. We were absolutely happy because Burley was operated by the city and the county so African American students went on to school as if nothing had ever happened. The black schools weren't closed. I never missed a year of school because of massive resistance. Uh, only the white kids suffered because they closed the white schools so that we couldn't get into them. I started out at all white school. So I never went to the black school. When I got to the first grade, I couldn't go into Venable. There was an adjacent building, so we were housed in that building that year while we were still in court. Virginia, like much of the South, was willing to shut down the system of public education. What, what isn't widely known is it could have been worse. Uh, the senior leadership of the state of Virginia was willing to close all the public schools. They were willing to shut down the entire public school system uh, in order to stop desegregation. It only actually happened in the city of Norfolk, Charlottesville, and Warren County. In Arlington, the schools were never shut, but the General Assembly abolished their elected school board to try and stop integration. You had a separate action in Prince Edward County. Two days ago, two historic decisions were handed down in the state of Virginia. One from the state Supreme Court, the other from the federal district court. Both decisions will fall with enormous impact upon the entire South. Massive resistance laws were declared unconstitutional by both the state Supreme Court and a federal district court in early 1959. In 1959, the courts ruled Virginia's massive resistance laws unconstitutional and forced the public schools to reopen. On February 2nd, Arlington County and the city of Norfolk were the first to desegregate their schools in Virginia. Even though we were 11 years old at the time, we had been part of like a training program for all the students that had been uh, sort of trained or looked forward to integrating the schools. We had classes on what we could expect. And so we were just part of the beginning of the end of the process to integrate Virginia public schools. We were fortunate to be selected, so it was something that we had our obligation to do to go through with this and make it better for others, even though we only had a small part in it. It was very chaotic when we came out of Ronnie's house to walk to uh, Mr. Newman's car. They just wanted to all get pictures of everything. We just walked down that sidewalk and you'll see a lot of pictures of us. It's kind of like the long, lonely walk into Stratford. And we walked into the school. They had some students there that were going to be our buddies. Arlington County had lots of police presence on the school property. And when I was eating lunch, the police officer would come over and check to make sure, you know, we're OK. And they walked past the classroom, so. It really went pretty smoothly that day. That first day, my mom told me to hold my brother's hand and to watch out for him because I was the oldest. I didn't know when I got to the school that the eighth graders had to go one way and the seventh graders had to go another way. But when I had to let go of his hand, I wasn't even afraid for me. I was scared for my brother. How was I going to watch out for him if I had let him go? When we got to the imaginary line was the beginning of the white section. And on both sides of the road were these men all dressed in black with rifles. When I saw them, I reached back and grabbed Skip's hand. We did not speak. We didn't say a word. As we walked through those policemen, we realize the meaning of massive resistance. The masses resist them. And what's your name? Doris Johnson. And how old are you, Doris? 16 years old. And what grade would that put you in? 11th grade. I said, the best thing for me to do is to help get inside this building. I intend to 
I went on up to my homeroom and all. And when I sat down at my desk, all the other desks started moving back. And it was just like a whole big circle was vacant around me. And I was just sitting in the desk all by myself right here. And the teacher didn't say, you know, well, move your chairs back. Why y'all moving those chairs? Bring them back, bring them back. No, didn't say a word. Although Charlottesville reopened its public schools in February, they were still segregated because the courts gave the city an extension. Their schools were desegregated in September of 1959. The structure of the high school was that there were multiple entrances. And at the main entrance, yeah, there were a lot of people out there standing. But we went to one of the back entrances. There was only three of us. I was not subjected to all the catcalls and the uh, vocal abuse that you saw in other communities. There was a lot of anxiety, and each and every day thereafter, for the five years that I was there. Because I didn't know anything about school, and I was, in some instances, probably the last one to get to class, um, all the seats were taken, so I had to stand in the back, you know, just little things like that. Nobody would get up. You know that's going to happen. So there's no sense in getting all bent out of shape about it. Let the teacher do their thing. You want uh, your students to sit down, you make sure that we have somewhere to sit down. The question was whether or not we were going to be able to uh, thrive in, in, in that sort of academic environment because, of course, in, in those days and even now, they're saying they said that black students were not equal to white students. And of course, that was the other thing. We had to prove them wrong. And, and we did, <laughs> so. During the week, I'm going to school. I'm a good girl. I said on weekends, we're trying to get into the movie theater. We're on the picket line. I said, I'm really quite the rebel here. I said, people don't even really see that side of you. When you left out of that school, you didn't see pretty much students until the next day till you went back to the school. I didn't go to my prom. So I think I've missed a lot of socialization opportunities. As a result, I was very happy to be leaving because I said, okay, I'm just gonna surround myself with black people. I remember one day we were studying United States history and we were talking about slavery. The teacher says, people think that slavery is bad. But slavery isn't bad, it wasn't bad. Why, if she had been living, pointing at me, back in the days when we had slavery, she would have had it real good because she would have been one of the house slaves. They would have let her stay in the house, clean the house, take care of the babies, cook. But she wouldn't have to be out there in the hot sun, and she'd be happy to be in that house. The boys started pointing at me, and they would say, house slave, house slave. And I mean, they just kept pointing at me. Although the courts had ruled massive resistance laws unconstitutional, Prince Edward County had found a loophole they decided to eliminate public education in favor of a private school system. Prince Edward County closed all their public schools, including the black schools, in the fall of 1959. You know, we were kind of all in denial. Oh, no, they will never shut the schools down. They can't do that. You know, people have to go to school. Sure enough, schools didn't reopen. Then me living so close to the school and seeing them locked down with chains, I mean, you. You know, I mean, you, you, you don't have a question about it, then you know that our schools are closed. They built a school called Prince Edward Academy. It was for white kids only. So they had a school to go to, and we didn't. That was painful. To think that pe uh, somebody would uh, build a school for one group of kids and not care whether the other group had an education or not. Those schools cost tuition. And if you were a poor white dirt farmer in Prince Edward County, you couldn't afford to send your child to that school. And so either you had somebody that could feel your pain, or because of that pain, they disliked you even more.
because you caused this to happen. This whole idea of a separate private school system for the white population was also being supported by donations from not only within Prince Edward County and Virginia, but many, many, and most of the other southern states. So Prince Edward County was almost like a litmus test. You know, if this survives, if this succeeds, then so goes the rest of the South. Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson, who had worked hard to desegregate Virginia's public education, were fighting to open the Prince Edward County schools. And I went with Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson up to uh, Farmville when they had church meetings up there. And when we came out there with Ku Klux Klan's across the street, you know, and I said, what do I, what do I get into up here? Oliver Hill and them went up there and they were not afraid to meet and all, you know. And that's why I greatly respected Oliver Hill and uh, Robinson for what they had to fight and go through at these small community meetings and so forth. The risk that they took to getting out there doing what they did. So there was a lot of resistance at that time. He went before the General Assembly in Richmond and shook his fist and said, this is wrong and we're not going to have it. His message was powerful and that's something that we said, you know, that's why we admired him for what he did. Volunteers offered free schools, but it wasn't until a court ruling in 1964 when public education was offered again in Prince Edward County. How long has it been since you've waited for a school bus before? Four years. Four years. Been to school at all in that time? No, sir. How's it feel to get back now? Well, the way I feel, I feel great. I mean, when I was going to school, I used to love it, and I still do. I want to go to school very much. To come back into an integrated school system, it was basically integrated to me by name only because coming back in 1964, I think at the high school we had two whites to join the ranks of about maybe 550. I stayed at home for two years without any education at all. That third year, a Brown Scout leader came to my home and asked my mother, could I go away to school? Or someone had found someone for me to live with. And that was how I got to get my education. My brother, younger than I am, he graduated from this high school here. My other two brothers that was in school during that time, they never had the opportunity to go to school, never. They were in the seventh grade when school shut down. Now, for some of the other people in the community, they didn't even go back to school. A lot of my cousins, my friends, wherever they stopped, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, that was it. It was a combination of experiences that we had. You had guys and girls graduating at 20, 21, 22 years old. From high school, they hung in there, you know. What was challenging is the student that did not see a classroom until they were 10 years old. I can't imagine how that would have affected me. Sitting in a classroom with someone that's six, not knowing how to read and write as I should. And right today, that scar still exists in a lot of people because of that type of experience. Well, now you're back home again, how did it go today? Uh, I enjoyed myself today. I like going to school. I always did. And uh, I feel great, I mean, about going back again. There was no real integration. There was desegregation. And for years, the public school boards managed to enforce a program of tokenism. And there was struggle for years after massive resistance. When you look at all of what was happening prior to setting the black man free, so to speak, by signing the Civil Rights Act in 1964, you have all of this occurring. You're still trying to make, in essence, a hundred years worth of progress a reality. 
We've gone from absolute segregation before Brown v. Board of Education to mandated judicial integration that took 20 years to happen, a Voting Rights Act that finally established voting rights for African Americans, civil rights laws that opened up hotels and restaurants and everything else to African Americans, and now finally we're achieving some cultural integration. In 1989, 30 years after closing the schools, Virginia was the first state in the nation to elect an African American governor. So that I can say to you today that I am a son of Virginia. Thank you and God bless all of you. As the first election of an African American of any state in the Union was a symbol of a magnificent change for the better. I had people who would tell me, for instance, they said, no, I never voted for an African-American, but they never had a chance. When Wilder ran, there was a hidden white vote that would not vote for an African-American candidate. And it happened in New York, it's happened in Chicago, it's happened in California with Tom Bradley's races, it's happened a lot of places. But it didn't happen in 2008. And again, the cultural changes are ongoing and they're cumulative. And I think to some degree they're accelerating. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. 50 years after massive resistance, Barack Obama carried Virginia on his way to becoming the first African American president of the United States. I did not think I would ever see it. I figured, well, I'd be long gone, maybe my children. That was the best day of my life. I never did think that I would live to see a black man as president, to be very honest. I would never have thought it. And I think anybody who says honestly that they believed that it would have happened, I don't think they would tell the truth. The God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. I mean, I knew most black people would be happy, but to see the number of white people who were crying and who were so happy about um, this and, and who seemed to be so hopeful about America, now that was exciting to me. I was excited when America elected Barack Obama, but I also saw and heard the aftermath. Oh, now we're fine. We don't have any racial problems. And I thought, my goodness, we've, we've, we've sort of leapt to that conclusion. It's still ways to go, you know, till everything is really uh, equal uh, all across the board. It's a hopeful future, but people have to be honest about evaluating the problems, not push anything under the rug. The 70th Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, His Excellency, the Honorable Timothy M. King. Fifty years later, uh, Governor King would travel from Richmond, come to the church where the Norfolk 17 had been educated and apologize for the acts of Governor Ullman. And so to those of you who were denied that opportunity 50 years ago, on behalf of the Commonwealth, I do apologize to you. In the room when the governor spoke, I mean, there were 14 of the 17 were there. These folks are still in our community. As mayor of the city of Norfolk, I take this opportunity to express my profound regret to the Norfolk 17, their family members, and to the African American community of Norfolk for the wrongs committed against you and to all who suffered through these difficult times. It was time, you know, we apologized for what happened to you. We wanted to close some wounds, but also demonstrate how far we've come as a community. If you want a measure of how society has changed, just understand that the Richmond newspapers promoted massive resistance in the 1950s, and by 2009, they apologized for it. That in itself is a great sign of progress. I think it's been five years ago 
that I was invited to the class reunion and my class president apologized. I was in tears because they didn't really do anything. They did what their parents told them to do. And you see, I still hardly can talk about it. Now if you look at the schools, you know, the kids don't know what this is all about. I mean, they just think, take it as normal that you go to the closest school in your neighborhood, you know, regardless of what the color of your skin or anything. We integrated the schools because we didn't have a school. So it's very important to get your education, you know, because we paved the way for you to be able to go to school. Because if we didn't do it, you might not have a school. Going to the public schools wasn't just automatic. There was people that sacrificed, that gave up a lot, that uh, really made uh, a major impact. We paved the way for the rest of these students who are doing everything now. They're standing on our shoulders. We opened the door for them. And when I think about what we've been through, that's what makes me so proud. That I was one of the ones who helped open this door. It was worth it. It was definitely worth it. We've got a long way to go yet, but we have come so far.